Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms. And we want to turn to the 27th Psalm, Psalm 27. Um, Rose and I, uh, we, we, the last couple of days, we, were, we went to a minister's retreat, a minister's and wives retreat. And uh, they, they had like two sessions for the ministers and wives. And uh, the first one was on burnout, and the second one was on handling stress. Anybody here have stress? I mean, anybody here? Has, you know, stress is a, uh, is a kind of a common thing in all, I think, all humanity. And, uh, you know, we all suffer from stress one way or another, sometimes at work, sometimes financially, and certainly that was in a ministerial context, you know. And they gave us a book to read. It was a good book. It was, uh, it's called Leading on Empty, and it deals with burnout, okay, burnout. How many people, you ever felt burnout? Burnout. I, I was reading that, that book, and it said, and something I never realized, that burnout, you know, we normally think of burnout as like a psychological thing, like you get stressed out and everything. But it has a, uh, it has a physiological aspect to it. And, and the, but the way this book was explaining, you know, God designed our body so perfectly that he gave us all kinds of different systems in there to, to, to deal with things that happen to us. And, and one of the things he gave us, there's a, there's a substance in our bodies called serotonin. Ever hear that substance? Now, I'm not, now listen, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to try to get fancy with you, but this is just what I read in this book. And it says serotonin, whenever you get under a lot of stress, your body has this store of serotonin and it, and it pumps it into your bloodstream, it goes to your brain and it kind of like helps you mellow out, Mel, you know, mellow out a little bit. Like just after you eat a turkey dinner and you want to fall asleep, it's kind of like, it kind of helps you mellow out. But if you're, if you're under stress for a, an extended period of time, your reserves of serotonin start to run down. And what your body does, since it can't find any serotonin, it starts to pump adrenaline. Okay, now you know what, how many people know what adrenaline is? It comes out of your liver and it's like the fight or flight thing when, you know, if you get in trouble and, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, poof, you know, the adrenaline kind of pumps in and it gets you running. And what happens is if, if you run low on serotonin and you're pumping adrenaline all the time, you're going to burn out your motor. Uh, recently, there was a news article in, uh, in, I read somewhere, saw on the internet, where this fella had been out drinking, okay, and he got in his car to drive home and he started the car up and he passed out with the car running. And his foot rested on the gas pedal. So he was sitting there passed out while his car was revving. You know, if you hit the gas pedal where you're parked, it starts to rev. And eventually the thing like caught fire and blew up because it was revving too high. And what happens is when we start getting stressed out, we start, we start revving our motors, especially if we're low on serotonin. Okay, and people say, what's he talking about? That's not in the Bible. Well, we're going to be there in a minute. Okay, I'm just, it's a, it's a physiological thing that when we get so much stress and we just run out of juice, you know what happens. You know, your stomach gets tight. And everything. Anybody ever been there? And that literally, not only do you feel burnout, but literally it will cause your heart. I mean, it causes, causes uh, you know, physical uh, symptoms to happen. Panic attacks. Anybody here ever have an anxiety attack? <laughs> you know, or a panic attack, you know, just out of nowhere. And it comes from that, you know, that, that thing, that stress thing. And uh, in the last, you know, in the last several decades, they have developed medications for that. And I'm not against medications. I, you know, God can use medicine as anything. Uh, but ultimately, you know, whether you take medicines between you and God and your physician, but ultimately, whether you take medicine or not, it really boils down to what was spoken here and what God has spoke to us, that we need to look to him, uh, you know, before we call the doctor. And I'm, and I'm not against doctors. I, I believe we ought to call doctors. But before we call the doctor, we need to call on him. Because you can have the best doctor in the world if you don't have him. You'll just be doctoring for the rest of your life. But if you have him, if you call upon him, and that's what we need, I believe, more than anything. Uh, in Psalm 27, it's a psalm written by David. King David, and they're not really certain as to when the psalm was written, but most believe that it was written at the time when David was running for his life 
you want to talk about a stressful situation. We know, and if you read through the book of First and Second Samuel, that uh, there was a king, Israel's first king was a fellow named King Saul. King Saul had disobeyed God, and God told him through the prophet Samuel, he said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to another. And he sent Samuel the prophet to anoint David, who was a shepherd. Uh, he was the youngest of eight sons and probably the least likely. Nobody would have picked David, but God picked him. Anointed him to be king. And we all know the story about David and Goliath, how uh, you know, David was able to defeat the giant with just a slingshot and some stones and so forth. And that's recorded there. And if you read further, uh, King Saul made David like one of his trusted you know, advisors. And he sent him out to battle, and David became a mighty warrior. And when they would come back from battle, all the ladies would sing, coming back, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands, okay? Well, it was pretty good for David, but Saul, kings don't like to be outstaged by anybody. You know how that is. So Saul began to think, I need to get rid of David. He's, he's going to, you know, break into my territory here. The thing is, David was anointed to be the king. God had chosen him. So Saul began to pursue David, and he wanted to kill him. And David was running for his life, for his very life. That's a stressful situation. I've never been in that particular stressful situation. Maybe some of you have been. But he was running. And many believe that this psalm was written while he was running. Again, we know the story, and you can read through there. There were, times, there were two times when David had the opportunity to kill Saul. Two times when, when Saul wasn't looking, and David, I mean, it was, the opportunity was right there. And David's men said, David, now's your chance. You're the one that's anointed to be king. There's your enemy. Just, you know, take care of him, and it'll be done. He won't chase you anymore. But David chose, instead of killing his foe, his enemy, he said, I will not lay my hand on God's anointed. And he chose, instead, to show Saul how much he really respected him and loved him, even though... Saul was destined to be destroyed, and again, you can read that in history. But David is running for his life, and he, he, he feels compelled to not defend himself against Saul. He keeps running, he keeps running, he keeps running. And many people believe that this psalm was written at that time. So I, I hope we can read through this psalm this morning, and wherever, whatever you're running from, and whatever, is, whatever situation is hounding you, Whatever enemy is on your tail, maybe we can garner some strength from this. Uh, they didn't have, you know, uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors back then. They didn't have those kinds of medications back then. The only option King David had was to turn to his God. Let's just read a little bit this morning. And uh, afterwards, we want to have a word of prayer. There's many who are, who are under the weather, uh, Brother Scott. Brother D. Roy is out sick. A lot of people have been suffering with, a, with a, an intestinal thing, and some of you have been there and back. And, uh, so we want to keep those in our prayers. But uh, Psalm 27, King David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I, I want to ask you this morning, if we're going to embrace this by faith, okay, this thing that we call faith, if you are born again and saved, and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if your faith and trust is in the blood that he shed on the cross at Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins, I want to ask you this. Who should you be afraid of if he's your God, if he's your Lord? King David knew. He, King David could remember the time when Samuel came and anointed him with oil and said, I'm anointing you to be the king of Israel. He could think back to that time, and now he's running for his life. And he's saying, the Lord is my light. Everything else is darkness. Everything else around me seems every circumstance is geared toward my destruction. But the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God, I wish I could remember these words. When I feel myself being hounded or, or tracked by my enemies, when I feel as though I'm running for my, my life, whether spiritual or, or real, I've never had to run literally for my life. But there are times spiritually, come on, you know what I'm talking about, when you feel, you wonder if you're even saved. 
There are times when the devil has been screaming in your ear for so long that you're not worthy, you're not this, you're not that, you shouldn't be there, you should be out doing something else, what are you doing, you, you can't be saved. He'll be screaming and we let him do it, we let him eat our lunch, when we ought to come back to this verse and say, listen, the Lord is my light. I can remember the time when I got on my knees and I asked God to forgive me. I might not remember the exact day, but I can remember where I was and I can remember what I had done. And, I need to, and sometimes I need to go back to that place and say, listen, whatever Satan's trying to tell me, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. He's the only place I can find strength. I thank God for friends and loved ones. I thank God for my wife. But there's sometimes I can't get strength from anybody. Sometimes you don't have strength to give me. But he always has strength. He is always the one who can strengthen us and keep us. King David said, when the wicked, even my enemies, and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. You know, there's sometimes you don't even have to fight the battle. You don't even have to defend yourself. You don't have to stand up and put up a, 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 a fortress because God is our fortress. He's our strength. He's our, he's our bulwark. He says, though a host should encamp against me, and indeed King David was in that place where he had an, Saul's army, Saul brought a whole army out to get him. Just that one man. He said, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, will I be confident? You know, we all find ourselves in those times when it just seems the battle is too hard to fight. Sometimes you just feel like, come on, waving the white flag. You ever been there? Well, you're just tired of battling. You're tired of the struggle. You're tired of the obstacles. You're tired of the opposition. And sometimes you just want to say, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about this thing we call the Christian walk. Working out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Paul says in Philippians, sometimes it gets tiring. People got this idea that being a Christian is like all fun and games and everything is wonderful and everything is just, just reach up and but call listen. upon him. Who shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid of? Though a host should camp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, King David says, that I will seek after. Listen, what, this is what David wants. And he actually says one thing, but there's three things here, but they're really all one. He says, one thing I've desired, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. See, this isn't about eternity. This is about now. See, eternity, we know what eternity is like. Streets of gold, heaven, that's wonderful. In his presence, we know about that. But we're talking about right now. He said, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about God's presence. He's talking about God's presence. King David, running for his life, hiding in caves like a dog, realized that even in those places, he could be in the presence of God. How many people in this word that we can read about, who it looked like everything was turning against them, realized they had to get to a place where they were in the presence of God? And somebody said, well, God's everywhere. He is everywhere. But there's some places where you need to get alone with him. It might be a place. For Elijah, it was a cave on a mountain. For Moses, it was, it was, it was way up on top of that mountain, hidden in a rock where he saw the glory of God. For King David, he was running for his life. You know, sometimes when everything gets going so good, we don't think we need the presence of God. But when the trouble comes, and when the enemy starts to scream in your ear, that's when we need to find his presence. That's when we need to find a place that we could just get us and him. When everything else gets shut out, but the voice and the presence and the face of God, he says in verse 5, For in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. These two words translated hide, they're actually a couple different words in the Hebrew. 
The first one means, means to cover. He'll cover us with his wings. The second one means to remove from the presence of evil. God will cover us and take us out of the presence of evil. Even in the midst of our enemies, he said in, in the 23rd Psalm, Thou preparest a table before me in the midst of my enemies. See, it would be wonderful if when I got saved, all, all the problems went away. <laughs> you know. Since I got, I got a few more after I got saved. Matter of fact, Satan, when you, when you come to know the Lord, see, he'll leave you alone. If you're not saved, he'll leave you alone. He won't bother you. But as soon as you get saved, it, they'll come. The enemies will come. The doubt will come. The fear will come. The questioning will come. If, if we keep ourselves out of his presence, we'll never experience his truth. God wants to hide us. He wants to shelter us to keep us. Listen to what David says. I'm just reading a little bit this morning. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Do you know there's a time coming? And really the time can be right now that you could look down on your enemies. Sometimes the enemies look big and ugly, don't they? Whether they be spiritual or actual people, you know, actual physical enemies. Sometimes they can look big and we can look and say, oh, I can never overcome this situation. But God can get us to a place where we'll look down on our enemies. He can set us up on a rock where we can look down on our enemies. Because we have greater is he who is in us, that's what the word says, than he who is in the world. We can conquer our enemies. We can conquer our addictions. We can conquer our fears. We can conquer our doubts. Why? Self-help? No. Medication? No. We can conquer them by being in the presence of God. Knowing His will. Knowing His strength. He says, Therefore will I offer in His tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. I will sing praises unto the Lord. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. God is saying this morning, He said through the word that He gave, and I, I, I didn't share my word with anybody this morning. He said through the word He gave, Seek my face. Seek my face. Get alone with me. Now we get so bombarded with stuff, especially, you know, King David didn't have 200 channels. Right? He didn't have, you know, he didn't have Facebook and Twitter and he didn't have those things. We have all this stuff that distracts us. When all God wants us to do is seek his face. I got a problem with that sometimes. See, I, I'll say, uh, I'll say, I think I'm going to study, I think I'm going to do a little bit of studying at God's word. And I see, maybe, maybe some of you can relate to this to me. You ever, ever want to sit down? I do my reading and studying on a, on a computer. Okay? <laughs> I got Bibles on a computer and commentaries. And that's so cool because you can type in the word and it just pops right out instead of having to turn a bunch of pages. Okay? It's, it's, it's neat. It's, it's neat to do. But you know what happens to me? I'll sit down in front of the computer and I'll say, I think I'm going to study for my message on Sunday. And I'll get on there and an email will pop up. You got mail. And I'll go look at that email, and it'll be from so-and-so. It'll say, so-and-so has a, has a thing on Facebook. I'll say, hmm. Now I'll go see what so-and-so wants to say on Facebook. And I'll go, and I'll click on Facebook. You guys on Facebook. How many Facebook friends do I have in here? I have Facebook friends in here. Okay, that's all right. But I'll say, so-and-so posted a thing on Facebook. says, I think I'll go check out Facebook. And I'll go check out Facebook. And I'll look Facebook. I'll say, oh, you know, I'll see. And I'll look down. And, oh, there's another one. And I'll click on that. And uh, the next thing I know, about an hour and a half later, I've been halfway around the world in Facebook, but I ain't read two verses yet. Now, some of you that, that aren't on the computer, you know, it's a little different. You open up your Bible and you get to read and the phone rings. Huh? And we say, oh, I've got to answer the phone. And you answer the phone, you get talking. And boy, you know, half, well, some of you might talk for half an hour on the phone. I don't know. But you see, we need to learn. We need to learn to get alone with God. Turn the computer off. Take the ringer off of the telephone. They'll leave a message. Hide the TV clicker. 
get rid of all that stuff and get by yourself. And see, in our, in our society, go ahead, you can clap, that's all right. In our society, in our culture, we can't go like 40 seconds without having to change. That's why when you watch a TV show, every like 15 seconds a scene changes. Okay? On the commercial, the commercials are like 15 seconds, 30 seconds, quick. Because we're like quick, we want it real fast. And we like to see, you know, quick change of stuff. Churches are starting to say, well, we've got we to change the way we present things because people, that's what they want. Look, we need to turn all that stuff off. And we need to say, look, I don't care if this is 2012. I don't care when it is. I need to sit down, shut up, and get alone with God. And instead of telling him everything, I need to start listening to him for a change. And not through the filter of Facebook and all that stuff. That's, that has a place. That has a time. I'm not saying we just completely dissing that. But we need to find some time alone with God. Because that's where we'll get our strength. That's where we'll be able to stand up and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Reading on a little bit more. He says in verse 9, Hide not your face far from me. Put not your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. For when my father and my mother forsake me, and that can happen, then the Lord will take me up. He says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me with, in a plain path because of mine enemies. In a plain path. Lead me in a simple way. Now, we try to make things so difficult. We try to make things so complicated. But, you know, God's ways are very, very simple. They're very plain. My, uh, Pastor Harold, some of you know Pastor Harold, he, he quotes uh, Church on the Way, Jack Hayford. How many people know Jack Hayford? Jack Hayford said this. So somebody came up to him and said, how can I have peace? And Jack Hayford said, don't sin. <laughs> you know. You know, we want to we 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 write like a 20-chapter book. Well, give me, a, give me, a, give me a, a whole, you know, dictionary about how to have peace. Well, it's really simple. Two words. Don't sin. But see, we make it so difficult. We make it so complicated. We have to dig it. Listen to what he says. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Man, anybody been on the receiving end of that? <laughs> false witnesses? They call it slander. You ever been slandered? Let me ask you this. Have you ever slandered anybody? <laughs> well, that's another message. But have you ever been slandered? What do you, like, when somebody starts talking on you, what do you want to do? You want to get on the phone? Well, you, you want to, what, defend yourself, don't you? You know what? You can't defend yourself against slander. God will defend you. Get in his presence. He'll defend you. He says, False witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe cruelty. He said, I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. They were looking forward to heaven. We're looking forward to the streets of gold. We're looking forward to, to God's blessing for all of eternity. That's important. But what about right now? I want to see God's goodness here. I need to see him working in my life. I need to see him doing something in my life, in my heart. I need to see him giving me strength because when my serotonin levels go down and my adrenaline starts working up, the only thing... You know, you can go find some medication. That's all right. If, if, if you've got to do that, that's okay. But listen, I believe that God is able. I believe he's able to give that peace of God that passes understanding. In fact, I know he is. His word says so. We're going to read one verse and look at one more passage of Scripture. And I really am not going to keep you long today. He says, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. How many people like to wait? I don't like to wait for anything. I want it right now. Don't, get, don't catch me in a long line for anything. Because <laughs> you might get, I might get a little nasty. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And what will happen? He shall strengthen your heart. How many people have a weak heart right now? I'm not talking physically. 
I know, you know, we can have physical. I mean, how many feel just where you're at? You know, my, my heart's been tried. It's been tested right now. I feel like I'm drained. I feel like I'm strained. I feel like I'm getting burned out because of stuff that's going on in my life, stuff that's going on in the world, personal things that's happening. I get weak. I feel like God doesn't hear me anymore. You ever been there? You ever, you ever feel like God doesn't hear you anymore? But that's a terrible place to be, isn't it? That's a terrible place. Maybe, maybe you feel that way because you haven't listened to him. See, we think God doesn't hear us, but he tries to speak to us sometimes, and we keep our ears closed. And we, we're so busy talking, you know, you, you can't listen to somebody if you're, if you're talking all the time. Okay? One more passage of Scripture, and one that I know you all can probably quote by heart over in Philippians chapter 4. And it's a passage that we've quoted so many times, so many times. And the reason why we quote so many times is because it's so good. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, we, we read in the Old Testament, now here's the new. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. When they're breathing down your neck. When the enemy's screaming at you. See, how many people have had that experience? where Satan will come and scream at you, imitate your own voice, and tell you, you ain't nothing but a loser. How many have had that experience? I have. You're nothing but a failure. You're nothing but a nobody. You'll never be nothing but a loser. The Apostle Paul, King David, and all the other great cloud of witnesses to say this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because if I'm saved, I'm not saved because of what I did. I'm saved because of what he did. If I depend on myself for salvation, I am a failure. I'm a loser. I'll find myself in hell. If I think I'm going to be good enough or make myself right enough to enter into the presence of God, I'm, going, I'm, I'm a loser. But the Lord is my light. And my salvation. See, if, if I'm my own light, then I need to be afraid. But if the Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. We're in his presence. Be careful. God, help me. Help, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for me and maybe for all of you. Be careful for nothing. What have you been worrying about this week? I can give you a list. I can give you a short list. <laughs> okay. And be honest with yourself. Anybody here worry? Is there anybody here that's a chronic worrier? Worrier. Worry. I'll put my hand up. Chronic? I'll just worry about everything. Worry about you know, worry about, the, you know, what's going on in the house, worry about the neighborhood, worry about money, worry about blah, 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 blah. Paul says, listen, put that away. You know, you can choose to put that away. I like, I always tell my wife, I said, it was my mom's fault. She taught me how to worry. She did, boy, my mom was good at it. I've, I said that before, my mom was a worrier, but she was, she was good at it. She taught me, well, how to worry. See, I keep, I keep blaming her, but I can't blame her. See, it's up to me to decide if I want to be that or if I want to say the Lord is my light and my salvation. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You know what he's talking about? Being in God's presence. Being in his presence. What's the cure for being burned out? What's the cure for living with a cloud of worry and dread? Get in the presence of God. Get in the presence of God. If you're a believer, listen, if you're not a believer, it doesn't matter. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's where we need to be more and more. We'll read on. We, we know it. We'll read it. And we're, and we're going to close. It's short, it's short this morning. 
Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, oh God, I need your peace. I can't, I can't get peace anywhere but in his presence. I can read books, don't give me peace. They don't give me peace. I can read the words of men, and maybe good men, good words. There's no peace. I can go to friends, I can go to fellow ministers, and we can talk and pray together, and that's encouraging, and, and we, can, we can encourage one another and help one another and, and pray with one another, but the only real peace that, that counts, the only real peace that's going to have an effect can only come from Him. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. King David, when he was hiding in that cave, he was being chased, he was running for his life, but he had something that his enemy didn't have. He had the peace of God. He was able to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He was able to know that it was in God's hands. Even though, from circumstances, he could find himself dead any minute. But he knew what God's plan was for his life. And he was able to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The peace of God which passes understanding shall what? Shall keep or guard. That word keep means like, a, like a, a, a fortress. Shall build a fortress around your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You know, Satan attacks us. I'm, I'm not here to give him glory this morning, but that's just the way he attacks us up here. It, it begins, it's like from the neck up. Remember how many people remember Teresa used to come here? She, she used to say it's from the neck up. This is where the battle is. It's in our minds. And the more time we spend in God's presence, the more we'll be able to stand up and say to Satan, get thee behind me. I have found myself, when I've allowed myself to be distracted, I find myself at the mercy of what the enemy tries to tell me. I listen to it. I start to believe it. I start to believe what he says. But when I get in the presence of God, oh, nothing he says can shake me. Why? Because it's the peace of God that we can only find by being in his presence. That we can only find by making our requests known unto him and listening to what he has to say to us. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, he says, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest. But think about what you've watched on TV this last week. I don't mean to get in anybody's case. Think about the stuff you've watched on TV this last week. When, when Rose and I went to the, to the retreat, I wanted to turn on the TV. I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> this is a classy place, too. We went to it. It was nice. You know, they got us a cut-rate deal. So I clicked it on, and, the, and the, the TV didn't come on, you know. It's nothing. It said AV input. I, so I started playing with the buttons. Nothing. I got snow. Nothing. Now I was missing Judge Judy. <laughs> I had to <laughs> Think about what you've watched on TV this last week. See if it fits this. See if it fits this description. And I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip. On, don't, don't anybody get mad at me. Listen to what he said. Whatsoever things are true, you don't find much of that on TV. I hope nobody watch them debates. I don't, I don't watch them debates because I like things that are true. Okay. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Can you find something pure on TV nowadays? I find it very difficult to find something pure on TV. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think. Let me ask you. What you watched on TV this last week? The music you've listened to this last week? Uh -huh. Somebody give me a... The knives are coming out. The things you've talked about with other people this last week? The things you've listened to from other people? I wonder how well it fits in this description. Let me read it one more time. 
I'll get you out in time for lunch. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, the apostle Paul says, do, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, I'm sorry, but I think it would be very difficult if you spend three or four hours a day playing Warcraft <laughs> in your one piece. And I don't even know if that's the name of a game. I, I've heard it. Warcraft. I, mean, I was talking to somebody one time. They were telling me they didn't have any peace, they didn't have any peace, they didn't have any peace. So I went to their house to talk to them. I looked on the TV and there's a guy shooting at them on TV. You know, one of them games. And you shoot back. I'm saying, well, no wonder you don't have any peace. You're playing games where people are shooting at you. <laughs> it's bad enough that the devil throws stuff at you. Now you're actually playing games where they're shooting bullets at you. And we said, why can't I have any peace? These things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do in the God of peace. So how many people need peace in here this morning? You haven't had your share of peace. You found yourself wanting Anxious, worrying, afraid, questioning your salvation, wondering what tomorrow is going to hold, living in dread. You know, God spoke to us this morning through his words and now through his word. So it's up to you. It's up to me. What am I going to do with God's word? So I could go back and it, it, it you know, you do what you want. You can go back and jump in. Where you, you know. Jump in the pool. Or you can go find a place where you can get into God's presence. Just you and him. Just you and him. You know, he might want to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. You know what that is? You know, one-on-one. -on -one. I can remember when I was in high school, if the principal called you to his office, our principal anyway, you didn't want to, you didn't want to take that trip. <laughs> if they said, Carmen Butler, come to the principal, come to the principal's office. I'd be like, uh-oh. <laughs> Sometimes God says, hey, I want to talk with you. It will never be, it will never be to hurt you, but will always be to draw you closer. How many people here need to have a one-on-one -on -one with God this morning, in this week, in this month, in this year? How many people would say, it's been a long time since I got along with God? It's been a long time since I shut everything off and shut everybody out to get into his presence. We're going to pray this morning. And I guess it would be all right if you just wanted to come up and stand and we could pray with you. You need to get along with God. You need to get along with God. You've not been, and, 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 and this isn't said in a condemning way, it's just not been, you've not been alone with God. You've been throwing a fleece out saying, God, is this, is this right? Is this wrong? What God is calling you, if you will, he said up here through Brother Todd, if you're willing, he can deliver you from your fear, he can deliver you from your addictions. He can deliver you from all these things that Satan is using to, to drag you through the mud. God can deliver you if you just take some time with him. Won't you come? We're going to pray. Stand with me as we, as we get ready to close and pray. But if you, if you uh, need to come.